short presentation, I will discuss Roger Luckhurst's introduction in Bram Stoker's Dracula and its reference to not only the 1897 novel, but also Anna Lily Amaper's 2014 American horror western film, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. In his fascinating introduction, Roger Luckhurst points out that Stoker, while having borrowed some of the formal innovations of the gothic genre, may simply have been a vehicle for the cultural energies of the late Victorian period. As Luckhurst puts it, Dracula crystallised an image, dramatised a certain predatory menace in Queen Victoria's Jubilee year and evoked an authentic sense of Christian dead, embodying in one elusive figure everything that shiny modernity was at risk of forgetting about its blood-soaked history. You see, according to Luckhurst, Stoker's book in response to certain late Victorian concerns, seeks to reaffirm a masculine action with a chivalric code that idealises the feminine and the maternal. In a time when the professions were gaining political and moral headway, the plot sees a group of middle-class professionals unite in a type of blood brotherhood, which sets out to eliminate a foreign threat and its blemish from English womanhood. However, as Luckhurst illuminates, Jonathan Harker, a member of the Brotherhood, is consistently feminised, becoming the damsel in distress, trapped in Dracula's castle, and unmanned by three sexually provocative brides of Dracula. Worse still, Harker is rescued from the vans by the Count himself, who declares, this man belongs to me, and carries him to bed. If not for his role among the vampire hunting Brotherhood, Harker's manhood might not have been restored. All this, says Luckhurst, is almost certainly in response to the anxiety-inducing woman question posed towards the end of the 19th century, with women at long last obtaining property rights in marriage, allowed to partake of universities and professions, and campaigning for women's suffrage. A further political matter of the time, which Luckhurst says is evident in Stoker's plot, is the apprehension raised over London's growing immigrant population and even a fear of deteriorating British blood. Dracula, a Transylvanian who buys properties in the poor immigrant districts of London, is considered to have degraded blood. Whereas the Brotherhood consists of English blue blood, American vitality from Morris and Dutch density from Van Helsing. Perhaps more astonishing is Luckhurst's revelation that the Book of Dracula is tainted with anti-Semitism, and not just because of the constant references of the Count's aquiline nose, his hate of the crucifix, and stockpile of gold coins. Indeed, from the 12th century onwards, Jewish contingents were blamed for the murders of Christian children since Jews were considered bloodthirsty through their exclusion from the Christian Eucharist. When Dracula prevents the three female vampires from feeding off Harker, he throws them a bag containing a baby, an act which appeals to the blood libel. All things considered, however, Lucko's cautions reading too much into the novel, adding that it is still a rattling good read, retaining a genuine power to unsettle and unnerve. If Stoker's Dracula seemingly captured the cultural imagination of the West in terms of vampire franchises, as Luckhurst suggests, then Anna Lily Amapur's A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night can only be described as a cultural catalyst for change. Whereas Dracula is described as a tyrannical cape-wearing lord, Amapur's vampire takes the form of a shador-wearing, skateboard-riding feminist out for, well, blood. A figure of vengeance instead of evil, she, known as the girl, prowls the streets of Iranian town, Bad City, deftly sinking her fangs into men who are guilty of gender-based violence, yet showing tenderness to her man of choice. Shot entirely in black and white, the film, while dark, sensual and intimate, presents as a gothic fiction in reverse. There are no traditional vampire hunters to speak of, or final staking, but the film makes an interesting point that touches on some traditional views about vampirism, 
As Lacus relates, French writer Voltaire, in his 1764 philosophical dictionary, mentioned he agreed with a certain opinion that the only real vampires were stock jobbers, brokers, and men of business who sucked the blood of the people in broad daylight, an anti-capitalist sentiment backed by Karl Marx himself in 1867, by which time the metaphor was well established. If this is the case, then it stands to reason that one of the girl's victims, an abusive drug dealing and thieving pimp called Saeed, is himself a vampire, figuratively speaking. One could go so far as to deduce that the film portrays a literal vampire on the hunt for figurative vampires, so to speak. But in any case, Amapur, like Stoker, acts as a medium for some important issues of our time, from gender politics to patriarchal violence and even Islamophobia. Finally, Lacoste is correct when he says the vampire has proved impossible to lay to rest, especially with its huge variety of metaphorical possibilities. Indeed, when it comes to vampire fictions, it really does seem as if we have an ever unquenchable thirst. Thank you for watching.